South Africa ruling party suffers its worst election losses since apartheid. The Rio Summer Olympic Games officially opens Friday amid a cloud of controversy. And a Nigerian film producer and director talk about producing films in the U.S. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidoui. You are this is Africa 54. South Africa's ruling party has suffered huge losses in local elections. The African National Congress is still leading overall, but the party of Nelson Mandela is seeing its worst electoral performance since the end of apartheid, with about 90% of ballots counted. Political analysts say voters are frustrated with the country's high unemployment and rampant political corruption. Results in Johannesburg, the country's largest city and economic hub, as well as the area around Pretoria, the capital, are too close to call, where the opposition Democratic Alliance is looking to make an inroad. The ANC has already suffered an embarrassing loss to the Democratic Alliance, with the opposition winning Nelson Mandela Bay, named after the ANC's star figure. And joining us on the phone from Johannesburg, South Africa, is BOA's Anita Powell. Anita, what does this loss mean for the ANC, or does the party still have some control? Hi, Esther. Thanks. Well, I want to be clear. This isn't a loss. If an alien came down from, the, from another planet today, he would say, why, why is everybody talking about the ANC losing? To be clear, they still won about 60 percent of seats in the entire country. What we're talking about here is they have lost a lot of ground to the opposition, namely Democratic Alliance. Um, as you mentioned, in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, and in Port Elizabeth, a.k.a. Nelson Mandela Bay. So they've lost points compared to last election, but they haven't lost in the absolute sense. So, Anita, why is everyone then making such a big deal out of this? Well, this is the famous ANC. This is the party of Nelson Mandela, the party that is credited with bringing an end to apartheid. This is the party also that President Jacob Zuma said, memorably, will rule until Christ comes back. So this is not a party accustomed to defeat. This is a party accustomed to wide margins, comfortable margins. And that's not what they got this time. And Anita, what does this mean actually for the future of the ANC party? So short term, what this means in some of these municipalities, we're talking about Johannesburg, Pretoria, and Nelson Mandela Bay, are coalition governments. That's going to be very interesting to watch, to see how well the ANC plays with others. Um, and that's going to be a real bellwether and a real indicator to voters uh, about what they should choose in the big elections in 2019. That's the end of Jacob Zuma's second term. They'll be electing a new president in its provincial elections. And it will be a really interesting moment if, um, no matter how this goes, uh, voters will have a real chance to see how the opposition governs, how the ANC governs. Anita, thank you. Keep watching it for us. We'll be getting back to you uh, uh, next week, Monday. Anita, thanks again. That's Anita Powell reporting from Johannesburg. The games of the 31st Olympiad in the Rio de Janeiro are already underway, but the official opening ceremony is Friday night. And what's usually a joyous time is also seldom without controversy. This year is no different. Arash Arabasadi reports from Washington. The Olympic torch arrived in Rio de Janeiro by boat. After being met by street protests, which forced the flame to detour from its preset path. Not the only controversy surrounding these games. There's the Russian doping scandal that pits the International Olympic Committee against the World Anti-Doping Agency, which wants to ban all Russian athletes. Also, there's the threat of Zika. More than 1,700 cases of birth defects in Brazil link back to the mosquito-borne virus. Then there's the water in Guanabara Bay. It's very polluted with raw sewage and comes with an unofficial warning label. Vaccinate athletes against hepatitis A. Avoid swallowing water. Avoid having a close contact with the water. Amnesty International reports a worrying spike in violence. In the past three months, between April and June, the increase in the number of people killed by the police in the city of Rio was of 100% when in comparison with the same period last year. Athletes from around the world are already in Rio. For some, like Indian wrestler Sakshi Malik, the rewards outweigh the risks. 
It's strange to see how people change. They're interested in me now that I'm rising to the top, yet didn't support me when I started. My family and coaches always backed me, but everyone else taunted me, saying, why are you playing a man's game? Ukrainian rhythmic gymnast Ganna Ritsatinova says the games give her a chance at revenge for Russia's annexation of Crimea. I want to prove to the entire world that we are strong, strong in spirit, and the whole situation only hardened us, our whole team. There are no thoughts of moving. More than 11,000 athletes registered to compete in Rio's Olympic Games. Despite the scandals, water, mosquitoes and protests, this is the moment for which many have spent their lives preparing. After all, sports are about overcoming adversity. Arashi Arbasadi, VOA News, Washington. Changing lives by saving lives. In Nigeria, it often means protecting people from unsafe food. Young Nigerian Balarabe Ismail, a 2016 Mandela Washington fellow, wants to improve the lives of his countrymen and fellow Africans by making sure the food they eat is safe and healthy. We have enormous problems, and we have limited resources. With my experience here, I feel more responsible than before. I feel indebted by, you know, the U.S., my country, and my community to drive changes, positive changes. I'm Balara Bilayamin Ismail from Nigeria. And I'm here at the Ohio State University studying uh, public management. We have visited a number of food processing industries, which is very much relevant to my area of uh, uh, expertise. And we've been to uh, different uh, hospitals and public health departments, which is also very important because we have to relate agriculture what food people are eating, and then what will be the consequences of eating that food to them, you know, with respect to their health and well, physical and uh, uh, mental well-being. Originally, I want to specialize in food science-related food, but when I go there, I discover that the contemporary issue in food science and technology is food safety. It has been reported that over 200,000 people are dying in Nigeria due to food one related disease. And we can't just hold our arms and leave it to continue, so we have to do something. The public health department that we visited, like here in Columbus, they are really, really concerned about food safety. And they have set out certain procedures in place in case any food safety issue happens. They have a rapid response system. You know, in my country, for example, if the, you know there is cholera uh, issue, it will take some days or months before actions will be taken. But here, actually, they have within seconds, they can be able to start taking uh, control measures. And I see that kind of um, changes from being reactive to being proactive. You know, Nigeria has been critical, I think, to the success of Africa, been the giant of Africa, the most populous country. And I think um, we have to set a model for other African countries. So I, I would say from my own personal point of view that I want to be uh, somebody that can provide solution to problems. Uh, one of the things I, I can say I learned is that how do you develop your leadership skills to make changes in your community. With the leadership skills and more responsibility, we can be able to change certain things. There are so many things that does not require funds or resources or like financial resources, but require leadership skills. And I want to be responsible and then make others also more responsible to bring changes. I see myself in the future being um, a change agent and a change for the better and not just temporary change 
it will be a permanent change for, for my country. In business news, the U.S. employment report sent stocks higher Friday uh, with more on trading trends and what made business news in Africa. Here's Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting from NASDAQ in New York. Good evening from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Jill Malandrino with the U.S. weekly market wrap and African market wrap. The three major averages in the U.S. are trading pretty good this morning. You could see the Dow Jones up almost 1% and the NASDAQ almost at 1% as well, leading the indexes. And this is really on tech and social media stocks, which really pumping all three major averages higher are the great all-important payrolls report we got this morning. 255,000 jobs were created versus consensus of 170,000. And the unemployment rate remains at 4.9%. As a result, gold and non-U.S. dollar currency moved lower while the U.S. dollar soared higher, as did equities. Let's take a look at some trading trends over the past few weeks. The S&P 500 index remains not far off record highs, trading in a narrow 30-point range over the last 15 trading days. As investors remain complacent and markets look for a potential catalyst, either push stocks to new highs or allow markets to correct after surging in a straight line higher since the brief late June pullback following Brexit. Now, since April, the S&P 500 is up 6%. Just think about this. We were down 14% on the February 11th low. Even a pullback in oil hasn't dented markets, nor has mixed economic data, while mostly better earnings fail to push markets higher. So we really are stuck in this tight range here, with the exception of the strong activity that we see this morning. So while companies are beating on low expectations, year-over-year -year revenue is still lower, and that is where the issue lies. Three central bank meetings over the past week has also failed to generate volumes or board market moves as volumes remain light. So what will get markets out of the recent trading range is the question traders are asking. Turning to what made business news on the continent this week, Africa's biggest mobile phone operator, MTN Group, cut investor payouts by almost 50 percent as it reported its first ever half-yearly loss after taking a hit from a $1 billion regulatory fine in Nigeria for missing a deadline to cut off unregistered SIM cards from its network. MTN has also been struggling to accelerate subscriber and profit growth as years of price wars and regulatory pressure hit margins and weakening economies squeeze consumer income. Commercial banks shed 711 jobs last year due to increased use of technology in customer service, marking the first time employment in the industry fell since 2002. Now, this is according to Kenya's central bank, and this is because technology is lending to increased efficiency. Finally, the African Export-Import Bank and the Export-Import Bank of China have signed an agreement to create a $1 billion China-Africa investment and industrialization program to facilitate the creation of special economic zones on the continent, further increasing relations between the two countries. From the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, I'm Jill Malandrino for Africa 54. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a Nigerian film producer and film director talk about filmmaking in the U.S. Stay with us. wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. And joining me in the studio now is Don Okalo, a Nigerian film director, and Kem Denchuku, a Nigerian film producer. The two have been working together and have made huge strides in the diaspora film production industry. Don, you teach creative writing. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, introduction to films yes. at uh, Texas, Texas Southern University. University. You have also written several fiction novels. Yes, ma'am. What motivates you? 
Um, the desire to tell a story, a compelling story, that's one. And of course, you know, you want uh, an audience to build up an audience that will eventually uh, uh, look at your work. So, you know. That uh, is what uh, the motivation uh, behind it is. Uh, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and Kem, I understand you also recently completed three shots and one feature film in just 14 days. How did that happen? <laughs> well, uh, I put time into the pre-production work to make the production stage easier for me. It was tough, but doable, so I did. And uh, Don, again, you have an ambitious undertaking. Both yes. of you have a, quite an ambitious undertaking yes. to start an online platform for movie lovers. Tell us more about this oh, one. Golden Eye TV. Mm -hmm. Golden Eye TV, it's, um, it's a specialty of ours, and uh, all we're trying to do is to build a web platform where, you know, filmmakers can come and visit with us and then have their products, you know, viewed by uh, mm -hmm. a special kind of breed mm -hmm. of film watchers. So Golden Eye TV is a web TV, it's a platform <clears throat> for streaming TV and movies. So we're going to launch it uh, sometime in, uh, at the end of this month. Okay, yeah, have you done Houston. some trials already? Oh, of course. And of course. it's doing well? <laughs> it's doing okay. fine. Okay, and Kem, let me turn to you. And of course, you know, we featured you here before. We yes, talked to you previously. Mm -hmm. And you have done so much in so short time. You have been a filmmaker. You are, you've written books as well. And you are a mother. How do you coordinate all this? Um, well, what I do actually is to uh, take deep breaths, first of all. And, of course, I take God on board with me. That's the only way for me to keep moving. But when, when you talk about film production, really, what does it really take? Do you have to work on locations? You have to... What, what comes into well, play? Well, I mean, once the, uh, a script is given to me, I read it and see if it's something that I would like to do. It's not every script that I take. The story actually is what drives me. So once I get that, of course, then I have to find out if there's an investor. Of course, then we look into locations and casting the right actors for, uh, the, you know, the, their role. So it takes a whole lot, a whole lot. I mean, when you're watching a movie, when it's finally done, it looks a lot easier. But when you come on the set, 10, 12 hours, in fact, last week, we were up. I'm not lying. We were up 48 hours straight. No sleeping. No sleeping. <laughs> no sleeping. I thought I was going to crash, but, you know, I'm here, so. And the kids in the background. <laughs> oh, now, yes. let's talk, Don, you know, that's very interesting. But then yes. again, let's talk about uh, one of the trailers that, that I've watched is The Pound of Flesh. Yes, yes, It's yes. kind of a thriller. It's ooh, yeah, breathtaking yes. as well. What's the idea behind this one? Uh, well, you know, in, in, I think 25, 27 years ago, I, um, I, I, I witnessed an accident in Houston, Texas, and um, it, it was, you know, compelling in such a way that um, it left indelible marks on me. And uh, after that fiery accident, I knew there was a story behind it at the time. So 18 years ago, I wrote a story called Realm of Angels. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, when I met her, and that's where the juices started flowing, and then uh, we, you know, changed the title into something else, and eventually made a film out of it. But it, it's really, really suspenseful. People have to watch that to know what I'm yes, talking about. Yes, but indeed. again, Kim, you are a content maker. What really goes behind making content in a film? First, the story. Second, of course, the money has to be there. <laughs> Third, you have to have a director with a creative mind. Then, of course, you have to have also a producer with a, a creative mind. Then you have, the right, have to write, have the right DP, director of photography. Then, of course, you have to cast the right actors because you don't just say, oh, you know, you wake up in the morning and you want to make a movie. You have to, if you don't have all the, if you're trying to make, uh, say, gumbo, if you don't have the right ingredients, yeah. it's not going to taste good. It's not going to come out good. So it takes a whole lot. 30 seconds for each of you. <laughs> what's, in, what's next in line for you, Dan? Um, Jurica Road and uh, Mona Lisa Morgan, including <laughs> Those are House new, of new 1000. Films. Films. They're all films. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, the films that he mentioned, of course, I would like to, I love taking still photo photographs, so definitely would like to find a way to monetize the pictures that I've taken. People love them, so. Yeah. Hopefully you can come back and tell us how to be <laughs> film stars, <laughs> film producers and directors, yes. and so we'll love all Thank that. Thank you so much, Esther. All right. Thank you both yeah. for joining me on Africa 54, and good luck with your future ventures. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. African fiction and writers make their mark. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Maria Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines.
In Libya, U.S. warplanes launch a bombing campaign to help Libyan forces take Sirte back from the Islamic State militants. In South Africa, early municipal election results indicate a major setback for the ANC. In Ivory Coast, a military court sentences two Ivorian soldiers to 10 years in prison for associating with the perpetrators of the terror attack in March that killed 19 people at a beach resort. Finally, in Nigeria, Nigeria, a startup in Lagos is helping to save lives through its new app, LifeBank, which helps find, store, and transport blood through the country. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Now, the annual Kane Prize for African Fiction was recently awarded in Britain. To learn more about the prize and challenges African writers face, reporter Molly Simon spoke with Tope Florin, a previous winner of the prize, and Alicia Adams, a founding trustee for the prize and vice president for international programming at the Kennedy Center here in Washington, D.C. The Kane Prize for African Short Stories was established in England in 2000 to honor the late chair of the Africa 95 Festival. At the beginning of July, the five Kane Prize finalists from Somalia, Kenya, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and South Africa traveled across London discussing their work. Among the finalists was Tope Falarin, who won in 2013 for his story, Miracle. Alicia Adams, a trustee for the prize, talked about his work. What he is, is, is writing about is a Nigerian experience in America. And I think that's interesting. Some people say, well, that's not really, you know, African writing because he's not in Africa. It's an American story. But I think that um, for, you know, any of the immigrant populations, America is a country of, of, of immigrants, that these stories are valid. Tope Falarin explained what going to the Kane Prize events in 2013 meant to him. It changed my entire life because it was the first story I'd published and nobody was taking my work seriously. I went from not having any kind of visibility to traveling around Europe and Africa and America and talking about my work and talking about my, my inspirations and aspirations. I asked Falorin and Adams what the primary challenges are for people who want to write about Africa. The publishing capital of the world is New York and perhaps London, but New York and uh, the staffers there, for the most part, haven't been to Africa, you know, haven't lived as immigrants in the States. So I think a lot of their exposure to those life experiences comes from what they're reading or what they're seeing on television. And, and so that, I think, in some ways limits the kind of work that they, uh, that they accept. I think that, that that's changing. There are a number of publishing collectives that are uh, flourishing in Africa and, and Europe as well. I'm thinking specifically of uh, Gelada, Cassava Republic, that's based in Nigeria and now has an outpost in London. And I think it's important that some of us who have gone through these tough experiences go on the other side and, um, and, and say that the work that is coming in from far-flung parts of Africa and Europe and the diaspora is important and needs to have access to a wider audience. I think that the internet and many um, websites now for, for writers has sort of leveled the playing field to a certain degree. Adams said she believes Sir Michael Caine would be proud of what has been created in his name. Something did happen at the Caine Prize, which he would have enjoyed, was that I think it was a um, Somalian uh, writer that, that, that won that year. It was a woman. And the Somalian ambassador was there, and he was outraged that a woman would win. So he walked out. So Michael, you know, that would have been great because we are doing something important and we're making this statement. She deserved it and we're not abiding by the, abide by the rules. The Kane Prize is accepting entries for its 2017 prize through January and will also hold a workshop for promising writers in March or April in the hopes of inspiring future winners like Falarin. Molly Simon for VOA News. We leave you with this video from a Cameroonian artist Josefina Tanga and her song, Ayene.
Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Does this word mean something good has happened? Unleashed. The president is sending Secretary of State John Kerry to the Middle East to help build a coalition to defeat the militants who have unleashed a wave of violence that has included attacks on Iraq's Christians and other minority communities, and recently the videotaped killing of American journalist James Foley. Unleashed means to let something very powerful happen quickly. It is like taking a leash off a dog and letting it attack someone. In our story, the militants unleashed or set off a wave of violence. Usually, unleashed does not mean something good. So, the next time you hear the word unleashed, you will know what this news word means.